This land is your land. This land is Good evening. Thanks for tuning in. This is Heartstock Radio. And I'm your host, Carol Murphy. And today we have a guest, Macy Solser of Restore Design Build. She's an architect. And in just a moment, she will be with us and tell us all about what she is up to. Remember that you can find us on Facebook. You can also email us at heartstockradio at gmail.com. And um, just a moment. Macy will be with us and uh, can't wait to share her story. Thanks for listening. This is Heartstock, and today with us is Macy Solser of Restore Design Build. Hi, Macy. Hi, Carol. Nice to chat with you today. Oh, thank you for being on Heartstock. Can you please give our listeners just a little intro here about yourself and this company that you've started, Restore Design Build? Yeah, I am an architect out of Billings, Montana, and I've lived in Billings pretty much my whole life. I was born in Sydney, Montana, but raised in Billings. And then I went to architecture school, MSU in Bozeman. I decided in my junior year of high school that architecture seemed to be the right choice for me. So um, it was a great thing that we had such a wonderful school in our state to attend. So, yeah, so decided to be an architect, pretty, pretty easy decision for me in a lot of ways. We can talk more about that, I suppose. But, um, yeah, uh, my husband and I have a business in Billings right now, um, as you mentioned, Restore Design Build. And we started our company I guess officially in 2015, kind of the end of 2015. And yeah, he's a contractor and I'm a, I'm a architect. So it, it seems to be a pretty good fit for us. And when we can, we like to focus on restoration and rehabilitation of old homes, old buildings. We do some camper remodels, um, really anything old. Um, we like to breathe new life into. So whenever we get a chance to do that, that's, you know, the work we have a, a passion for, but we do really any kind of job, new construction and that, and that sort of thing as well. And when we do new construction, we try to focus on green building methods and sustainable methods that focus on energy efficiency and wise use of materials and, and water efficiency and that sort of thing. So yeah, that's kind of a us in a nutshell. <laughs> Exciting. And yeah. you mentioned that when you were in high school, you made this career path decision and that it was an easy choice for you. And I, I'm always amazed because I've always been, I don't know, myself personally, the experience has always felt more like being pulled in a hundred different directions. So I'm wondering, I'm just curious, why why was it such an easy decision and what was it about architecture that drew you? Well, I think when I was a junior, my dad, who actually was the vice principal of my high school, um, so that was always really interesting. I I guess I just always felt this need to achieve and to do these things because my dad was um, was always around and always there, which was a good thing. But he posed a challenge to me to say, hey, like, if you decide what you want to do, like your mom and I will, will get you through school. So what, what do you want to do? And so I really started to think about it. And I guess I was always really good at math. My dad was a teacher. My mom is a nurse. And so I, I, I knew those paths weren't really for me. I was good at math, good at science, but you know, I, I also really loved the creative aspect and I loved art and um, was really inspired by being creative too. So I had a teacher my junior year named Mr. Gray. I decided to take a drafting class and he was just a really cool teacher and and questioned me a lot of times about what I wanted to do and said, Hey, did you know that MSU in Bozeman has an architecture program? You should start thinking about it. And I thought, man, you know, that that's great. I'm really good at math. (laughs) I could, you know, do that part, but I also really, really love the creative too. So maybe architecture was just this beautiful marriage of the two things. And once I felt that way, I thought, man, that's, that's, that's what I'm going to do. I can be practical, but also, you know, dream and be creative and and conceptualize things too. So I don't know, it just kind of was an easy choice, which 
I sort of felt bad about it at the time because a lot of kids I knew, um, you know, were like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I know I want to go to college, but I don't know what to study. And I guess I just felt like this was what I wanted to do. And, and it, and it was great that we had such a great school in Bozeman to go to. So yeah, I, I don't know. It just it all came together. And I actually remember, I tell this story sometimes when I was a kid, I went to the Catholic schools in Billings and we had this really great playground when I was in the second grade and um, we'd run out to the playground and everyone would get on the swings or, you know, everyone kind of go off in their groups and, and do different things. And I would find myself along the edge of the fence and there was usually like a dirt pile or something that sort of accumulated from all the leaves. And I would start to kind of outline floor plans on the playground. I would take the dirt and create walls and openings for doors. And sometimes the girls on the playground would come play house in these. So that memory kind of came back to me too as I was making this decision when I was in high school and so I don't know there was just certain things like that that just felt felt like the right decision I guess um, at the time and has proved to to be a good one so yeah and as you were going through your schooling and starting your company was there a point at which you realized I really love this or was that always with you I think in terms of what we do now, that was an evolution of school and travel and then um, my first couple of jobs. But I think, I don't know, the traveling part of it and seeing the world and seeing historic structures and the way people interacted with them and the way you felt when you went in them or even an outdoor space. Sometimes it was a plaza or a, a gathering space or a park um, that was very highly designed and I don't know, just felt really special. And I think that that um, just continued to fuel my interest in historic architecture, I guess. Um, I had a really great historic um, architecture teacher in, in college as well that just, I don't know, opened your eyes to different things and you just start learning and you want to learn more. And and so I think that I went into architecture school. It was really hard. First year is really hard. They weed out a lot of people. You apply and I thought, man, okay, this was really hard. I might be not the most creative or the most conceptual or the most out there person, but I really do like this and I worked really hard. And I told myself if I get into second year, then I'm, I'm in and this is my thing. And so mm-hmm. I got in and just kind of went full speed ahead. But yeah, I think that coming to the historic part and the restoration and rehabilitation that we, we like to do now, the, the journey to that started in college. And then in my first job, we did a lot of rehabilitation projects in downtown Billings that I just always really liked the challenge of and was really inspired by by that form of architecture. So, How many people, what percentage of your class did not make it to second year? Oh my gosh. I want to say we had... 300 people like first semester and then it was probably down to closer to 200 second semester and once we actually were in second year I believe there was maybe 60 and then I graduated with I think 30 so so you started out with 300 and you ended with 30 (laughs) yeah pretty much and and some people took longer like some of my classmates did eventually graduate it was just like within that five-year span some people took, you know, another semester or another year to complete. So that happened too. And some people got their bachelor degree and went to a different master's program as well. But yeah, that was kind of the <laughs> the bubble down process for us. And at what point did you decide that you were drawn to restoration as opposed to really preferring a blank slate and new construction, new projects? Yeah, I actually was thinking about that today a little bit. And when I was in my second year, I I remember most of my projects being projects that were that ended up being historic in nature that one of the projects was uh, we had to create a a train station in Bozeman at the kind of the existing old train station site. And there was an existing building there. And while most of my classmates had torn the building down and kind of went crazy and did their own really, you know, kind of cool modern train depot. I proposed reusing the buildings that were there and creating new connections and things between kind of the two buildings that were there. So I always really like having that historic piece. It gives me a lot of inspiration and then trying to tie it in some new elements or some more contemporary, contemporary architecture. And then another project actually was in Butte. So those people listening from Butte or in Butte or no Butte at the original mine where there's 
from the outdoor stage now, that was one of our sites my second year. We had to create a community center and I reused the pump house and then the other building on site that's now the bathrooms as part of the community center. So I had those kind of as the anchor, created a new gathering space between the two and then used the head frame space underneath there where the stage is now as kind of an outdoor gathering space. So I don't know, I just, it was just a easy way for me to get inspired, I guess. Um, I feel as though historic structures have a character and a story to tell that either can't be recreated or just isn't readily available in in what we create new. So yeah, I guess as far back as then, I've really been intrigued by that. And then my fourth year, I was able to travel abroad and spend a semester in, in Europe and other parts of actually Africa. We were in Morocco. And so just kind of really got to interact firsthand with a lot of historic structures in Europe, which is really amazing and fascinating. And then, as I mentioned earlier, my my first job, we did a lot of rehabilitations of old warehouses in downtown Billings to loft apartments and just felt like a really good reuse of of buildings that needed needed some love and some some new life in them and had more stories to tell. So I guess I'm just really inspired by it. It's easy to find a creative outlet with those those existing things. Mm-hmm. And at what point did you start doing business with your husband? Was this a company that you started before you met or did you initiate the whole idea and concept after you guys got married? Well, I would say that even as we were dating, we talked about what it would be like to have a business. At the time, I was working for a firm here in Billings and he was working for a construction company as well in Billings, but we talked about what it might be like. We had a lot of similar interests. He also has a passion for historic buildings. He actually lived in a Yegan mansion in Billings. Yegans are a big family here. They owned a lot of land and had a lot of property and just a very well-known name in Billings and in the area. And so he had owned a, one of one of the brothers' mansions on the south side and had done some remodeling to that. And so that's really where he started to to learn about the techniques and the things to restore that property. And and so I don't know, we, we always kind of talked about it as we dated. And I come from a family where <laughs> work a nine to five job and you know where your paycheck's coming from and and all those things. And so being self-employed just sort of, I guess scared me a little bit more than it scared him. Um, him and his father had had worked together in their own company for a long time before he worked for a contractor here in Billings. And so anyway, there was just a lot of things with that. But yeah, we talked about it. And then I would say right after we got married, we kind of through a series of, of events just started our own company. We We didn't totally plan it. It was a little bit of kind of a spur of the moment thing, but definitely something we'd talked about. Uh, but yeah, we just were like, well, we're going to just do this. It's the time is now we're married. Um, we've been talking about it for a long time. And and so we just kind of jumped in. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. I, I just kind of jumped into it. I think that's how most things happen It's in life. But, um, to take that but yeah, leap. we had talked about it. Yeah. Yeah. We just had to take that leap. So, but it's been good. It's, we've learned a, a lot. Mm-hmm. We've learned a lot. We're going to take a quick music break. And in just a moment, we'll be back with Macy Solser. And hopefully we can talk about uh, what it's like being a woman in this predominantly male-oriented industry. We'll be right back. Thanks for listening. This is Heartstock. No 
This is Heartstock Radio, and I'm your host, Carol Murphy. Today, we are speaking with a female architect from Billings, and I'm just going to let let out a little no longer secret that uh, Macy is bringing her company here to Butte soon. Um, we're with Macy Solster of Restore Design Build. What's it like being a woman Macy, in this industry, architecture and being an architect. How many women were there in your graduating class? You know, I was thinking about this today as well. And I think that we were pretty close to half and half, um, which at the time was pretty, this was 2006 when I graduated, but at the time was pretty, pretty rare. It typically was maybe two or three in the you know, a class of we kind of separated into two two groups, and in a you know in a class of say fifteen or in a studio of fifteen, you might have you know two another female or, or or two in your class. But ours was pretty half and half. So I would say that going into the real world of the profession of architecture, I had a bit of a skewed perception because of the way that. I was in school. The women in our class were really smart and really good at what they did and everyone felt pretty equal. And so I don't know if that's just the college environment or as again, as I said, we were pretty half and half. Um, But yeah, I wasn't completely prepared for what I was entering into in the workforce. Um, And even our professors at the school, um, we had some really strong, wonderful female professors, um, both in studio and and in our kind of regular required architecture classes like history and um, that sort of thing. So yeah, I I think I, I kind of entered in a little bit naive and, you know, graduating at 23 and being in the workforce, you just, there's certain things you just aren't really aware of. You're just happy to have a job and ready to work hard and learn all the things. And so kind of the male dominance in our field has just kind of come more to the forefront uh, recently in the last few years, especially with starting our business and kind of the impetus for starting our business. Part of it was to kind of be in control of of what we were doing both creatively and and on kind of the financial side. So I, I was, it was, I was, had a skewed perception, I guess, coming out of school, um, and, what and that might be like. What was it that you encountered that you hadn't anticipated? I guess just not being seen as an equal. The people, I guess, who know me might say that I have a bit of a masculine energy. Um, I've always really gotten along with, with men, never had a problem. Um, growing up, my dad was, you know, one of my best friends. And so, just always been really comfortable, you know, with men and women. I'm a woman, so that's an easy one, but I've just never felt intimidated or anything like that. And so I guess I just, you know, wasn't really prepared to not, I mean, not to say I haven't worked with great people because I have, I've had wonderful, wonderful mentors in my life that are, you know, men in the profession, but just kind of not being seen as, as an equal and at first you kind of don't really pay attention to it because you're like, oh, I'm new and whatever, or, oh, I'm at a new job or I'm at a new place. Like people, you know, I kind of need to establish myself, but I don't know, at, at a certain point, there's just this, this mold that you feel like you need to, to pour yourself into. I think sometimes as a woman in any, in any situation, it seems, but in a predominantly male workplace, men and women are just different. And so I didn't realize I was trying to fit a mold at first. And then when I started to and maybe got penalized or maybe got passed over for something because my male counterpart see, was seen as, you know, he needed this more than I did. I, I can remember missing out on a few jobs because, oh, well, there's a there's a male there and, and he has a family to take care of and, and provide for. And somehow that was more important than, you know, the family I had to provide for, or, you know, my livelihood was somehow not seen as important. So I don't know. It's just, it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing. It's a tricky topic, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, the workplace is a thing to point out inequality in because there's data and there's things we can look at that are pretty hard and fast to say, oh yeah, there's a pay gap or there's a disparity here. Um, But I think it's a, it's a bigger systemic systemic thing and a systemic question, but, but yeah, I guess that was some, some things I just wasn't, wasn't prepared for. It was, oh, I felt like I proved myself. So now I'm good, but that just 
kind of wasn't the case. Yeah. Um, if, if that makes sense. It does. It does because it's, it's, you know, the voice that you're speaking and the, the, the truth and the reality is, is repeated by many of the guests that we've had here on Heartstock. So, and, you mm-hmm. know, just thinking in my own experience as well, it's not just something that I've encountered from men, but I've encountered it from women as well. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, my generation definitely indoctrinated and at a very young age that what what's most important for women is marriage and child rearing and you you know mm-hmm. if you're lucky enough to have a career it's just not nearly as important as the same career for your male counterparts so i think that it's changing for sure and just talking about it like we are right now i think is um helping with that and you work with your husband and we we have had a couple of other guests in the past that were a husband and wife team so this is always an interesting twist do you have any advice for those out there who are working with their spouses how do you make it work yeah i would say well first of all it's not not for everybody and that's okay (laughs) i think that people sometimes think, oh, that'd be great, or they've romanticized the idea. And um, I think you just have to be really, really real about um, who you are as people and, you know, how you work together. And I think that um, for us, we just complement each other really well. I think, as I mentioned earlier, even, you know, when we were friends and then ultimately when we started dating, it was like, oh man, well, you're a builder and I'm an architect. And we got the comment all the time, like, oh, you guys would make such a great team. And I think we resisted that a little bit at first because we're like, well, we need to figure out some other stuff first. But ultimately it, it makes a lot of sense. And for us, I mentioned I have kind of a masculine energy and I would say that my husband has a very intuitive nature and a bit more of that feminine energy that allows him to connect with people. And he's, you know, a sensitive guy in in a great way. And so we're able to sort of play off that. I can kind of be the tough guy when I need to be, and he can kind of bring me down and and vice versa. So I think we complement each other really well. We know each other really well. We're best friends. We like to spend all our time together and and we work really hard. And so for us, it just was like, oh man, if we could work together, then we'd get to be around each other more because when we were separate, it just seemed like long days apart and then we'd come home and this way we're able to spend more of our day together. So that's something that's been really, really great for us. I would also say that we have recently kind of found out what like our love languages are and there's another test called the Enneagram test it's sort of out there right now it's very buzzy and popular but it it gives you a number and and lets you know kind of the qualities of that number and how they relate to other numbers and so I'm a three which is an achiever and my husband is a nine who's a peacekeeper so in the Enneagram those you know, there's some always some conflicts, but for the most part, those two are pretty complementary to each other there. Um, and just, I think, knowing your love language for your partner spills over into work as well, because what's going to work in your personal relationship in terms of, I'm a words of affirmation girl. So in our personal relationship, it's great to hear that. But then in our professional relationship, it's great to kind of get those compliments from my husband as well when he recognizes that I did a, a good job. So um, so those have been some really key things for us. Um, we also have our own individual responsibilities within our business too. Um, he's out on site, he's handling subcontractors and doing all that. And I'm, you know, handling clients and dealing with design and, and some of the kind of the day-to-day stuff there. So we each have our own lane, which is really helpful, but then we're also able to kind of prop each other up and ask the good questions to each other and without overstepping too far. I probably overstep a little more than he does, but I think that helps as well as we're responsible for half and half of the business. So, And let's talk about you coming to Butte. When did you first entertain that idea and, and you know, why Butte? Well, I think we've been talking about it for, gosh, as long as I can kind of remember. I think uh, Mike and I together, I'd been to Butte a few times, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I did a project my second year in architecture school. So we spent a lot of time in Butte during the course of that project with site visits and stuff. But um, the first time we ever went, uh, he had never been. And other than he did tell me that 
He took his SATs, I believe, at the Finland Hotel. I'm not sure why, but when he was in high school, that was like a place to take them. And he lived in a really small town, so he had to go to a larger town to take it. So other than that, he hadn't really been to Butte. So we went one St. Patrick's Day, probably about gosh, eight years ago um, for the first time. And I don't know, we had a great time at St. Patrick's Day, but we were geeking out over all the buildings and Mm. all the stuff and the energy that we felt there and the people that we met. And that's kind of when those conversations started for us. And I would say we got real serious about it. We actually purchased a building two years ago in Uptown. And that's when we really were like, okay, we're doing this. We're buying this building. We're going to move here. We're going to relocate here. And in the years leading up to that, we just made a lot of good friends. We love the spirit of the community. Everyone's just willing to help us or willing to put us in touch with people and connect mm-hmm. us with those that are going to, you know, get us there and, and be our friends or be our advocates. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and we cannot wait for you to be here. And unfortunately, uh, we've come to the <laughs> end of the show. So for all of us who are awaiting your arrival in the meantime, how might we find you and contact you? Sure. We are on Facebook and Instagram. You can look for, uh, restore dot design build on Instagram and kind of search restore design build on Facebook and all our contact info is there and we're also working on a new website so we'll be putting that out into the world soon so that'll be another way to showcase our work so stay tuned for that I guess can't wait to learn more and uh, for you guys to be here um, there's thank so you. much going on and I think it's perfect timing thank you Macy for being our guest and for loving you too Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. This is Heartstock Radio, and I'm your host, Carol Murphy. We shall see you next week. Peace. Heartstock Radio is a production of KBMF 102.5, Butte America Radio. Hear our live programs every Friday at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time via live stream at butteamericaradio.org. Let's go.